Um, the Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved. Uh, this is a, a piece. Um, when you're a journalism student, uh, you're writing for the college paper. You like uh, words. You like uh, the whole idea of travel, of finding the story. Uh, you like to drink. Uh, what better author to delve into than Hunter S. Thompson? And uh, this was one of the first pieces that uh, really set that passionate, youthful uh, wanderlust uh, in me that made me want to actually write and uh, experience life and, and write about it uh, when I was younger. Still writing today. I uh, have a few books uh, published. Um, not an easy road if you're thinking about writing books. Um you know, when you can make uh, yourself as famous as your words, it really helps uh, working on that. But, uh, it, you know, this is just an original story. Uh, he thought it was uh, at first a disaster because it was crazy. It was off the cuff. He didn't organize it. It wasn't well structured. It was just basically him on a mission uh, with his buddy. He meets for the first time Ralph Steadman and they whoop it up at the Kentucky Derby. So here it is. The Kentucky Derby is decadent and fucking depraved. Pardon my French. I got off the plane around midnight and no one spoke as I crossed the dark runway to the terminal. The air was thick and hot like wandering into a steam bath. Inside people hugged each other and shook hands, big grins and a whoop here and there. By God, you old bastard, good to see you, boy. Damn good, and I mean it. In the air-conditioned lounge... I met a man from Houston who said his name was something or another. Just call me Jimbo. And here was, and he was here to get it on. I'm ready for anything, by God, anything at all. Yeah, what are you drinking? I ordered a margarita with ice, but he wouldn't hear of it. No, nah, no, nah, what the hell kind of drink is that for the Kentucky Derby time? What's wrong with you, boy? He grinned and winked at the bartender. God damn, we got to educate this boy. Get him some good whiskey. I shrugged. All right, a double... Old fits on ice. Jimbo nodded his approval. Look, he tapped me on the arm to make sure I was listening. I know this derby crowd. I come here every year, and let me tell you one thing I've learned. This is no town to be giving people the impression you're some kind of faggot. Not in public, anyway. Shit, they'll roll you in a minute, knock you in the head, and take every, every goddamn cent you have. I thanked him and fitted a marble into the cigarette holder. Say, he said, you look like you might be in the horse business, am I right? No, I said, I'm a photographer. Oh, yeah? He he eyed my ragged leather bag with new interest. Is that what you got there, cameras? Who you work for? Playboy, I said. He laughed. Well, goddamn, what are you, going to take pictures of naked horses? Ha, huh. I guess you'll be working pretty hard when they run the Kentucky Oaks. That's a race just for Phyllis. He was laughing wildly. Hell yes, and they all be naked too. I shook my head and said nothing, just stared at him for a moment, trying to look grim. There's going to be trouble, I said. My assignment is to take pictures of the riot. What riot? I hesitated, twirling the ice in my drink. At the track, on Derby Day, the Black Panthers. I stared at him again. Don't you read the newspapers? The grin on his face had collapsed. What the hell are you talking about? Well, maybe I shouldn't be telling you, I shrugged. But hell, everybody else seems to know. The cops and the National Guard have been getting ready for six weeks. They have 20,000 troops on alert at Fort Knox. They've warned us, all the press and photographers, to wear helmets and special vests like flak jackets. We were told to expect shooting. No, he shouted. His hands flew up and hovered momentarily between us, as if to ward off the words he was hearing. Then he whacked his fist on the bar. Those sons of bitches! God Almighty, the Kentucky Derby! He sh kept shaking his head. No, Jesus! That's almost too bad to believe. Now, he seemed to be sh sagged in his stool, and when he looked up, his eyes were misty. Why? Why here? Don't they respect anything? I shrugged. It's not just the Panthers. The FBI says busloads of white crazies are coming from all over the country to mix in with the crowd and attack all at once, from every direction. They'll be dressed like everybody else, you know, coats and ties and all that. But when that trouble starts, well, that's why the cops are so worried. He sat for a moment, looking hurt and confused, and not quite able to digest all this terrible news. Then he cried out, Oh, Jesus, what in the name of God is happening in this country? Where can you get away from it? Not here, I said, picking up my bag. Thanks for the drink, and good luck. 
He grabbed my arm, urging me to have another, but I said I was overdue at the press club and hustled off to get my act together for the awful spectacle. At the airport newsstand, I picked up a a courier journal and scanned the front page headlines. Nixon sends GIs into Cambodia to hit reds. B-52 raids, and then 2,000 GIs advance 20 miles. 4,000 U.S. troops deployed near Yale as tension grows over Panther protest. At the bottom of the page was a photo of Diane Crump, soon to become the first woman jockey ever to ride in the Kentucky Derby. The photographer had snapped her, stopping in a barn area to fondle her Mount Fathom. The rest of the paper was spotted with ugly war news and stories of student unrest. There was no mention of any trouble brewing at the University of Ohio called Kent State. I went to the Hertz desk to pick up my car, but the moon-faced young singer in charge said they didn't have any. You can't rent one here. You can't rent one anywhere, he assured me. Our derby reservations have been booked for six weeks. I explained that my agent had confirmed a white Chrysler convertible for me that very afternoon, but he shook his head. Maybe we'll have a cancellation. Where are you staying? I shrugged. Where's the Texas crowd staying? I want to be with my people. He sighed. My friend, you're in trouble. This town is flat full. Always is for Derby. I leaned closer to him, half whispering. Look, I'm from Playboy. How would you like a job? He backed off quickly. What? Come on now. What kind of job? Never mind, I said. You just blew it. I swept my bag off the counter and went to find the cab. The bag is a valuable prop in this kind of work. Mine has a lot of baggage tags on it. San Francisco, L.A., New York, Lima, Rome, Bangkok, that sort of thing. And the most prominent tag of all is a very official plastic coated thing that says, Photog, Playboy Magazine. I bought it from a pimp in Vail, Colorado, and he told me how to use it. Never mention Playboy until you're sure they've seen the thing first, he said. Then when they when you notice them seeing it, that's the time to strike. They'll go belly up every time. That's this this is this thing is magic. I'll tell you, it's pure magic. Well maybe so. I used it on the poor geek at the bar and now humming along in a yellow cab toward down toward town, I felt a little guilty about jangling the poor bugger's brains with that evil fantasy. But what the hell? Anybody who wanders around the world saying, Hell yes, I'm from Texas deserves what happens to them. And hey, and he had it, after all, come here once again to make a 19th century ass of himself in the midst of some jaded, atavistic freakout with nothing to recommend, with nothing to recommend it except a very saleable tradition. Early in our chat, Jimbo had told me that he hasn't missed a derby since 1954. The little lady won't come anymore, he said. She grits her teeth and turns me loose for this one. And when I say loose, I do mean loose. I toss ten dollars around like they're going out of style. Horses, whiskey, women, shit. There's women in this town that'll do anything for money. Why not? Money's a good thing to have in these twisted times. Even Richard Nixon is hungry for it. Only a few days before the derby, he said, if I had any money, I'd invest it in the stock market. And the market, meanwhile, continued its grim slide. The next day was heavy. With only 30 hours until post time, I had no press credentials, and according to the sports editor of the Louisville Courier Journal, no hope at all of getting any worse. I needed two sets, one for myself and another for Ralph Steadman, the English illustrator who was coming from London to do some derby drawings. All I knew about him was that this is his first visit to the United States, and the more I pondered that fact, the more it gave me the fear. How would he bear up under the heinous culture shock of being lifted out of London and plunged into the drunken mob scene at the Kentucky Derby? There was no way of knowing. Hopefully he would have arrived at least a day or so ahead and give himself time to acclimate. Maybe a few hours of peaceful sightseeing in the bluegrass country around Lexington? My plan was to pick up at the airport in a huge Buick Pontiac Ball Buster I'd rented from a used car salesman named Colonel Quick, then whisk him off to some peaceful setting that might remind him of England. Colonel Quick had solved the car problems and money, four times the normal rate, had bought two rooms in a scum box outside the town, on the outskirts of town. The only thing... The only kink was the task of convincing the moguls that Churchill Downs at Scanlon's was such a prestigious sporting journal that common sense compelled them to give us two sets of best press tickets. This was not easily done. My first call to the publicity office resulted in total failure. The press handler was shocked at the idea that anyone would be stupid enough to apply for press credentials two days before the derby. Hell, you can't be serious, he said. The deadline was two months ago. The press box is full. There's no room. And what the hell is Scanlon's monthly anyway? I uttered a painful grow. Didn't the London office call you? They're flying an artist over to do painting. Stedman. He's Irish, I think. Very famous over there. Yeah. I got it from the coast. Uh, The San Francisco office told me where we were all set. 
He seemed interested and even sympathetic, but there was nothing he could do. I nattered him with more gibberish, and finally he offered a compromise. He could get us two passes to the clubhouse grounds, but the clubhouse itself, and especially the press box, were out of the question. That sounds a little weird, I said. It's unacceptable. We must have access to everything. All of it. The spectacle, the people, the pageantry, the certainty of the race. You don't think we came all this way to watch the damn thing on television, do you? One way or another, we'll get inside. Maybe we'll have a bribe. Or we'll have to bribe a guard or even mace somebody. I had picked up a spray can of mace in downtown drugstore for five ninety-eight, and suddenly, in the midst of that phone talk, I was struck by hideous possibilities of using it out of that track. Macing ushers at the narrow gates at the, to the clubhouse inner sanctum, and slipping quickly inside, firing a huge load of mace into the governor's box just as the race starts, or macing helpless drunks in the clubhouse restroom just for their own good. By noon on Friday, I was still without credentials and still unable to locate Stedman. For all I knew, he changed his mind and gone back to London. Finally, after giving up on Stedman and trying unsuccessfully to reach my man in the press office, I decided my only hope for credentials was to go out to the track and confront the man in person with no warning, demanding only one pass now instead of two and talking very fast with a strange lilt in my voice, like a man trying hard to control some inner frenzy. On the way out, I stopped at the motel desk to cash a check. Then, as... A useless afterthought, I asked if by any wild chance uh, Mr. Stedman had checked in. The lady at the desk was about 50 years old and very peculiar looking. When I mentioned Stedman's name, she nodded without looking up from whatever she was writing and said in a low voice, Oh, you bet he did. Then she favored me with a big smile. Yes, indeed. Mr. Stedman just left for the racetrack. Is he a friend of yours? I shook my head. I'm supposed to be working with him, but I don't even know what he looks like. Now, God damn it, I'll have to find him in this mob of the track. She chuckled. You won't have any trouble finding him. You could pick that man out of any crowd. Why, I asked. What's wrong with him? What does he look like? Well, she said, still grinning, he's the funniest looking thing I've seen in a long time. He has this uh, this growth all over his face. As a matter of fact, it's all over his head. She nodded. You know, you'll know him when you see him. Don't worry about all that. Creeping Jesus, I thought. The screws, the press, that, that screws the press credentials. I had a vision of some nerve-rattled geek all covered in matted hair and string warts showing up at the press office and demanding Scanlon's press packet. Well, what the hell. We could always load up on acid and spend the day roaming around the clubhouse grounds with a big sketch pads laughing hysterically at the natives and swilling mint juleps so the cops wouldn't think we were abnormal. Perhaps even make an act. Pay. Set up an easel with a big sign saying, Let a foreign artist paint your portrait. Ten bucks each. Do it now. I took the expressway out to the track, driving very fast and jumping the monster car back and forth between lines. Driving with a beer in one hand and my mind so muddled that I almost crashed into a Volkswagen full of nuns when I swerved to catch it right back to the exit. There was a slim chance, I thought, that I might be able to catch the ugly British Britisher before he checked in. But Stedman was already in the press box when I got there, a bearded young Englishman wearing a tweed coat and raft sunglasses. There was nothing particularly odd about him, no facial veins or clumps of bristly warts. I told him about the motel woman's description, and he seemed puzzled. Don't let that bother you, I said. Just keep in mind that in the next few days there's going to be we're going to be in Louisville, Kentucky, not London, not even New York. This is a weird place. You're lucky that the mental defective at the hotel didn't jerk a pistol out of the cash register and blow a big hole in you. I laughed, but he looked worried. Just pretend you're visiting a huge outdoor loony bed, I said. If the inmates get out of control, we'll soak them down with a mace. I showed him the can of Chemical Billy, resisting the urge to fire it across the room at a rat-faced man typing diligently in the, in the Associated Press section. We were standing at the bar, sipping the manager's scotch and congratulating each other on our sudden ex unexplained luck of picking up two sets of fine press credentials. The lady at the desk had had been very friendly to him. He said, I just told her my name and she gave me the whole works. By mid-afternoon, we had everything under control. We had seats looking down on the finish line, color TV, and a free bar in the press room, and a selection of passes that would take us anywhere from the clubhouse roof to the jockey room. The only thing we lacked was unlimited access to the clubhouse inner sanctum in the sections F and G, and I felt we needed that, to see the whiskey gentry in action. The governor, a Swinnish neo-Nazi hack named Louis Nunn, would be in G, along with Barry Goldwater and Colonel Sanders. I felt we'd be in legal. I felt we'd be illegal in Box G, where we could rest and sip juleps, soak up a bit of atmosphere, and the Derby's special vibrations. The bars and dining rooms are also in F and G, and the clubhouse bars on Derby Day are a very special kind of scene. Along with the politicians, society bells, and local captains of commerce, every half-mad dingbat 
whoever had a pre- pretension to do anything within 500 miles of Louisville will show up here to get strutting drunk and slap a lot of backs and generally wake themselves oblivious. The paddock bar is probably the best place in the track to sit and watch faces. Nobody minds being stared at. That's what they're there for. Some people spend most of their time in the paddock. They can hunker down at one of the many wooden tables, lean back in a comfortable chair, and watch the ever-changing odds flash up and down on a big tote board outside the window. Black waiters and white serving jackets move through the crowd with trays of drinks, while the experts ponder their racing forms on the hunch betters pick lucky numbers or scan the lineups for right-sounding names. There's a constant flow of traffic to and from the Perry Mutual windows outside the wooden corridors. Then, as time nears, the crowd thins as people go back to their boxes. Clearly, we are going to have to figure some way to spend more time in the clubhouse tomorrow. But the walk-around press passes to F and G were only good for 30 minutes at a time, presumably to allow the newspaper types to rush in and out with photos or quick interviews, but to prevent drifters like Stedman and me from spending all day in the clubhouses, harassing the gentry and rifling the odd handbag or two while cruising around the boxes or macing the governor. The time limit was no problem on Friday, but on Derby Day the walk-around passes would be in heavy demand. And since it took about 10 minutes to get from the press box to the paddock, and ten more minutes to get back, that didn't leave much time for serious people watching. And unlike most of the others in the press box, we didn't give a hoot in hell what happened on the track. We had come there to watch the real beast perform. Later Friday afternoon, we went out to the balcony of the press box, and I tried to describe the difference between what we were seeing today and what would be happening tomorrow. This was the first time I've been to the Derby in ten years, but before that, when I lived in Louisville, I used to go every year. Now looking down from the press box, I pointed to the huge grassy meadow enclosed by the track. That whole thing, I said, will be jammed with people. 50,000 or so, and most of them will be staggering drunk. It's a fantastic scene. Thousands of people fainting, crying, copulating, trampling each other, and fighting with broken whiskey bottles. We'll have to spend some of our time out there, but it's hard to move around. Too many bodies. Is it safe out there? Will we ever come back? Sure, I said. We'll just have to be careful not to step on anybody's stomach and start a fight, I shrugged. Hell, this clubhouse scene right below us will be almost as bad as the infield thousands of raving, stumbling drunks getting angry and angry as they lose more and more money. By mid-afternoon, they'll be guzzling mitt juleps with both hands and vomiting on each other between races. The whole place will be jammed with bodies shoulder to shoulder. It's hard to move around. The aisles will be slick with vomit, people falling down, grabbing at your legs, keeping you from stomped. Drunks pissing on themselves in the betting lines, dropping hands full of money and fighting to stoop over and pick it up. He looked so nervous that I laughed. I'm just kidding, I said, don't worry. At the first hint of trouble, I'll start pumping this chemical billy into the crowd. He had done a few good sketches, but so far we hadn't seen that special kind of face that I felt we would need for the lead drawing. It was a face I have seen a thousand times at every derby I'd ever been to. I saw it in my head as the mask of the whiskey gentry, a pretentious mix of booze, failed dreams, and a terminal identity crisis, the inevitable result of too much inbreeding in a closed and ignorant culture. One of the key generic rules, or genetic rules, in breeding dogs, horses, or any other kind of thoroughbreds is that close inbreeding tends to magnify the weak points in a bloodline, as well as the strong points. In horse breeding, for instance, there's a definite risk in breeding two fast horses who are both a little crazy. The offspring will likely be very fast and also very crazy. So the trick is in breeding thoroughbreds is to retain the good traits and filter out the bad. But the breeding of humans is not so wisely supervised, particularly in the narrow southern society, where the closest kind of inbreeding is not only stylish and acceptable, but far more convenient to the parents than setting their offspring free to find their own mates for their own reasons and in their own ways. God damn, did you hear about Smitty's daughter? She went crazy in Boston last week and married a Negro. So the face I was trying to find in Churchill Downs that weekend was a symbol in my own mind of the whole doomed atavistic culture that makes the Kentucky Derby what it is. On our way back to the motel after Friday's races, I warned Stedman about some of the other problems we'd have to cope with. Neither of us brought any strange illegal drugs, so we would have to get, out, get by on booze. You should keep that in mind, I said. That's almost everybody you talk to from now on will be drunk. People who seem very pleasant at first might suddenly swing at you for no reason at all. He nodded, staring straight ahead. 
He seemed to be getting a little numb, and I tried to cheer him up by inviting him to dinner that night with my brother. Back at the motel, we talked for a while about America, the South, England, just relaxing and relaxing a bit before dinner. There was no way either of us could have known at that time that it would be the last normal conversation we would have. From that point on, the weekend became a vicious, drunken nightmare. We both went completely to pieces. The main problem was my prior attachment to Louisville, which naturally led to meeting with old friends, relatives, etc., many of whom were in the process of falling apart, going mad, plotting divorces, cracking up under the strain of terrible debt, or recovering from bad accidents. Right in the middle of the whole frenzy derby action, a member of my own family had to be institutionalized. This added a certain amount of strain to the situation, and since poor Stedman had no choice but to take whatever came his way, he was subjected to shock after shock. Another problem was his habit of sketching people he met in various social situations I dragged him into, then giving them the sketches. The results were always unfortunate. I warned him several times about letting the subject see his foul renderings, but for some perverse reason he kept doing it. Consequently, he was regarded with fear and loathing by nearly everyone who'd seen or even heard about his work. He couldn't understand it. It's sort of a joke, he kept saying. Why in England? It's quite normal. People don't take offense. They understand that. I'm just putting them on, putting them on a bit. Fuck England, I said. This is middle America. These people regard what, we're, what you're doing to them as brutal, bilious insult. Look what happened last night. I thought my brother was going to tear your head off. Stedman shook his head sadly, but I liked him. He struck me as a very decent, straightforward sport. Look, Ralph, I said, let's not kid ourselves. That was a very horrible drawing you gave him. It was the face of a monster. It got on his nerves very badly, I shrugged. Why in the hell did you think we left that restaurant so fast? I thought it was because of the mace, he said. What mace? He, he grinned. When you shot it at the head waiter, don't you remember? Hell, that was nothing, I said. I missed him. And we were leaving anyway. But it got all over us, he said. The room was full of that damn gas. Your brother was sneezing and his wife was crying. My eyes hurt for two hours. I couldn't see to draw when we got back to the motel. That's right, I said. The stuff got on her leg, didn't it? She was angry, he said. Yeah, well, okay. Let's just figure we fucked up about equally on that one, I said. But from now on, let's try to be careful when we're around people I know. You won't sketch them and I won't mace them. We'll just try to relax and get drunk. Right, he said. We'll go native. It was Saturday morning, the day of the big race, and we were having breakfast in a plastic hamburger place called Fishmeat Village. Our rooms were just across the road in a brown suburban hotel. They had a dining room, but the food was so bad that we couldn't handle it anymore. The waitress seemed to be suffering from shin splints. They moved around so slow, moaning and cursing the darkies in the kitchen. Stedman liked the fish meat place because it had fish and chips. I preferred the French toast, which is really just pancake butter fried to the proper thickness and then chopped out with a sort of cookie cutter to resemble pieces of toast. Beyond the drink and lack of sleep, our only real problem at that point was the question of access to the clubhouse. Finally, we decided to go ahead and steal two passes, if necessary, rather than miss the part of the action. <coughs> this was the last coherent decision we were able to make for the next 48 hours. From that point on, almost from the very moment we started out to the track, we lost all control of events and spent the rest of the weekend churning around a sea of drunken horrors. My notes and recollections from the derby days are somewhat scrambled. But now, looking at the big red notebook I carried all through the scene, I see more and more what happened. The book itself is somewhat mangled and bet. Some of the passages are pages are torn others are shriveled and stained by what happened with what appeared to be whiskey but taken as a whole with sporadic memory flashes the notes seem to tell the story to wit rain all night until dawn no sleep christ here we go a nightmare of mud and madness but no by noon the sun burns through perfect day not even humid stedman is now worried about fire somebody told him about the clubhouse catching on fire two years ago could it happen again horrible trapped in the press box holocaust a hundred thousand people fighting to get out. Drunken screams in the flames and the mud. Crazed horses running wild, blind in the smoke. Grandstands collapsing into flames with us on the roof. Poor Ralph is about to crack, drinking heavily into the hag and hag. Out to the track in the cab. Avoid that terrible parking in the people's front yard. $25 each, toothless men on the street with big signs. Park here. 
flagging cars in the yard. That's fine, boy. Never mind the tulips. Wild hair on this head. Straight up like a chump. Like a clump of reeds. <laughs> reeds. Clump of weeds. Reeds. Whatever. Sidewalks full of people all moving. I guess reeds are uh, weeds from the south, from Kentucky. Reeds. Weeds. Sidewalks full of people all moving in the same direction toward Churchill Downs. Kids hauling coolers and blankets. Teeny boppers and tight pink shorts. Many black. Black dudes in white felt hats with leopard skin bands. Cops waving traffic along. The mob was thick for many blocks around the track, very slowly going into the crowd, very hot. On the way to the press box elevator just inside the clubhouse, we came on a row of soldiers all carrying long, white riot sticks, about two platoons with helmets. A man walking nervously next to us said they were waiting for the governor and his party. Stedman eyed them nervously. Why do they have those clubs? Black Panthers, I said. Then I remembered good old Jimbo at the airport, and I wondered what he'd think of the think would we be thinking about this right now. Probably nervous. The place was teeming with cops and soldiers. We pressed on through the crowd, through many gates, past the padlock, the paddock where the jockeys bring the horses out and parade around for a while before each race, so the betters can get a good look. Five million dollars will be bet today. Many winners, more losers. What the hell? The press gate was jammed with people trying to get in, shouting at the guards, waving strange press badges. Chicago Sporting Times, Pittsburgh Police Athletic League. They were all turned away. Move on, fella. Make way for the working press. We shoved through the crowd and into the elevator, then quickly up to the free bar. Why not? Get it on. Very hot today, not feeling well. Must be this rotten climate. The press box was cool and airy. Plenty of room to walk around in the balcony seats for which watching the race and looking down on the crowd. We got a bedding sheet and went inside. Pink faces with stylish southern sag. Old ivy styles, seersucker coats, and button-down collars. May blossom senality, Stedman's phrase. Burnt out early, or maybe just not much to burn in the first place. Not much energy in these places. Not much curiosity. Suffering in silence. Nowhere to go after th- 30 in this life just hang on and humor the children let the young enjoy themselves while they can why not the grim reaper comes early in this league banshees on the lawn at night screaming out there besides a little iron negro in jockey clothes maybe he's the one who's screaming bad dts and too many snarls at the bridge club going down with the stock market oh jesus the kid has wrecked a new car, wrapped it around a big stone pole pillar at the bottom of the driveway. Broken leg, twisted eye. Send him off to Yale. They can cure anything up there. Yale? Did you see today's paper? New Haven is under siege. Yale is swarming with Black Panthers, I tell you. Colonel, the world has gone mad. Why, they tell me the goddamn woman jockey might ride in the derby, the derby today. I left Stedman sketching in the paddock bar and went off to the place to place our bets in the fourth race. When I came back, he was staring intently at a group of young men around a table not far away. Jesus, look at the corruption in that face, he whispered. Look at the madness, the fear, the greed. I looked, then quickly turned my back on the table that he was sketching. The face he'd picked out to draw was the face of an old friend of mine, a prep school football star in the good old days, with a sleek red Chevy convertible and a very quick hand. It was sad. With the snaps of a 32B Brazier, they called him Catman. But now, a dozen years later, I wouldn't have recognized him anywhere but here, where I would have expected to find him in a paddock bar on Derby Day. Fant slanted eyes and a pimp smile, blue silk suit, and his friends looking like crooked bank tellers on, the, on a binge. Stedman wanted to see some Kentucky colonels, but he wasn't sure what they looked like. I told him to go back to the clubhouse, men's room, and look for the men in the white linen suits vomiting in the urinals. They'll usually have large brown whiskey stains on the front of their suits, I said. But watch the shoes. That's a tip-off. Most of them manage to avoid vomiting on their own clothes, but they'll never miss their shoes. In the box not far from our Colonel Anna Friedman Goldman, chairman and keeper of the Great Seal of the Honorable Order of Kentucky Colonels, not all the 76 or so million Kentucky Colonels should make it to the Derby this year, but many had kept the faith, and several days prior to the Derby, they gathered their annual dinner at the Sealbach Hotel. The Derby, the actual race, was scheduled for late afternoon, and as the magic hour approached, I suggested to Sedman that we should probably spend some time in the infield, that boiling sea of people across the track from the clubhouse. He seemed a little nervous about it, but since none of the awful things I'd warned him about had happened so far, no race riots, firestorms, or savage drunken attacks, he shrugged and said, all right, let's do it. 
To get there, we had to pass through many gates, each one a step down in status, then through a tunnel under the track. Emerging from the tunnel was such a culture shock that it took us a while to adjust. God almighty, Studman muttered. This is a... Jesus! He plunged ahead with his tiny camera, stepping over bodies, and I followed, trying to take notes. Total chaos. No way to see the race, not even the track. Nobody cares. Big lines at the outdoor betting windows. Then stand back and watch winning numbers flash in the big board like a giant bingo game. Old blacks arguing about bets. Hold on there, I'll handle this. Waving a pint of whiskey and a fistful of dollars. Girl riding piggyback t-shirt says, Stolen from Fort Lauderdale Jail. Thousands of teenagers, group singing, let the sun shine in, ten soldiers guarding the American flag, and a huge fat drunk wearing a blue football jersey, number 80, ruling around with a quart of beer in hand. No booze sold out here, too dangerous, no bathrooms either, Muscle Beach, Woodstock. Many cops with riot sticks, but no sign of a riot. Far across the track, the clubhouses looked like a postcard from the Kentucky Derby. We went back to the clubhouse to watch the big race. When the crowd stood to face the flag and sing, My Old Kentucky Home, Stedman faced the crowd and sketched frantically. Somewhere in the boxes, a voice screamed, Turn around, you hairy freak! The race itself was only two minutes long, and even from our super status seats and using 12 power glasses, there was no way to see what was really happening. Later, watching a TV rerun in the press box, we saw what happened to our horse. Holy Land, Ralph's choice, stumbled and, is, and lost his jockey in the final turn. Mine, silent screen, had the lead coming into the stretch, but faded to the fifth at the finish. The winner was a 16-to-1 shot named Dust Commander. Moments after the race was over, the crowd surged wildly for the excess, rushing for cabs and buses. The next day's courier told of violence in the parking lot. People were punched and trampled. Pockets were picked. Children lost. Bottles hurled. But we missed all this, having retired to the press box for a bit of post-race drinking. By this time, we were both half crazed from too much whiskey, sun fatigue, culture shock, lack of sleep, and general dissolution. We hung around the press box long enough to watch a mass interview with the winning owner, a dapper little man named Lehman, who said he had just flown into Louisville that morning from Nepal, where he'd bagged a record tiger. The sports writers murmured that their admiration and a waiter filled Lehman's glass with Shabazz Regal. He had just won $127,000 for the horse that cost him $6,500 two years ago. His occupation, he said, was retired contractor. And then he added with a big grin, I just retired. The rest of the day blurs into madness. The rest of that night, too. And all the next day and all the next night. Such horrible things occurred that I can't bring myself to even think about them much. Let's put them down in print. Stedman was lucky to get out of Louisville without serious injuries, and I was lucky to get out at all. One of my clearest memories of that vicious time is Ralph being attacked by one of my old friends in a billboard room at the Pendidimus Club in downtown Louisville on a Saturday night. The man had ripped his own shirt open to the waist before deciding that Ralph was after his wife. No blows were struck, but the emotional effects were massive. Then, as sort of a final horror, Sedman put on his fiendish pen to work and tried to patch things up doing a little sketch of the girl. He'd been accused of hustling. That finished us up in Pendennis. Sometime around 10.30, Monday morning, I waked from the scratching, door at my door, at the scratching sound at my door. I leaned out of bed and pulled the curtain just back far enough to see Stedman outside. What the fuck do you want? I shouted. What about having breakfast? He said. I lunged out of bed and tried to open the door, but it caught on the night chain and bagged shut again. I couldn't cope with the chain. The thing wouldn't come out of its track, so I ripped it out of the wall with a vicious jerk on the door. Ralph didn't blink. Bad luck, he muttered. I could barely see him. My eyes were swollen almost shut, and the sudden burst of sunlight through the door left me stunned and helpless like a sick mole. Stedman was mumbling about sickness and terrible heat. I fell back on the bed and tried to focus on him as he moved around in the room in a very distracted way for a few minutes, then suddenly darted over to the beer bucket and seized a Colt 45. Christ, I said, you're getting out of control. He nodded and ripped the cap off, taking a long drink. You know, this is really awful, he said finally. I must get out of this place. He shook his head nervously. The plane leaves at 3.30, but I don't know if I'm going to make it. <clears throat> I barely heard him. My eyes had finally opened enough to me to focus on the mirror across the room, and I was stunned at the shock of recognition. For a confused instant, I thought that Ralph had brought somebody with him, a model that for one special face we'd been looking for. 
There he was, by God, a puffy, drink-ravaged, disease-ridden creature, like an awful cartoon version of an old slap snapshot in some once-proud mother's photo album. It was the face we'd been looking for, and it was, of course, my own. Horrible, horrible. Maybe I should just sleep a while longer, I said. Why don't you go on over to the fish meat place and eat some of the rotten fish and chips, then come back and get me around noon. I feel too near death to hit the streets at this hour. He shook his head. No, no. <coughs> I think I'll go upstairs and work on those drawings for a while. He leaned down to fetch two more cans of beer out of the bucket. I tried to work earlier, he said, but my hands kept trembling. It's terrible, terrible. You've got to stop this drinking, I said. He nodded. I know. This is no good, no good at all. But for some reason, it makes me feel better. Not for long, I said. You'll probably collapse in some kind of hysterical DTs tonight. Probably just about time you get off the plane at Kennedy. They'll zip you up in a straitjacket and drag you down to the tombs, then beat you with kidneys and big sticks until you straighten out. He shrugged and wandered out, pulling the door shut behind him. I went back to bed for another hour or so, and later, after the daily grapefruit juice run to the night owl food market, we had our last meal at Fish Meat Village, a fine lunch of dough and butcher's offal fried in heavy grease by the time ralph wouldn't even order coffee he kept asking for more water it's the only thing they have that's fit for human consumption he explained then with an hour or so to kill before we had to catch a plane we spread the drawings out on the table and pondered them for a while wondering if he'd caught the proper spirit of the thing but we couldn't make up our minds his hands were shaking so badly that he had trouble holding the paper and my vision was so blurred that i could barely see what he'd drawn shit i said we both look worse than anything you've drawn here he smiled. You know, I've been thinking about that, he said. We came down here to see this terrible scene. People out pissed out of their minds and vomiting on themselves and all that. And now you know what? It's us. Huge Pontiac ball buster blowing through traffic on expressway. A radio news bulletin says the National Guard is massacring students at Kent State and Nixon is still bombing Cambodia. The journalist is driving, ignoring his passenger, who is now nearly naked after taking off most of his clothing, which he holds out the window trying to windwash the mace out of it. His eyes are bright red, and his face and chest are soaked with beer. He's been using to rinse the awful chemicals off his flesh. The front of his woolen trousers is soaked with vomit. His body is racked with fits of coughing and wild choking sobs. The journalist rams the big car through traffic and into a spot in front of the terminal. Then he reaches over to open the door on the passenger side and shoves the Englishman out, snarling, Bug off, you worthless faggot! You twisted pig fucker, crazed laughter. If I weren't sick, I'd kick your ass all the way to Bowling Green, you scum-sucking foreign geek. Mace is too good for you. We can do without your kind in Kentucky. Scalin's Monthly, Volume 1, Number 4, June of 1970. And that's uh, the Kentucky Derbent is Decadent and Depraved from the Great Shark Hunt by Hunter S. Thompson. Good stuff, man.